You not only predicted virtual like VR and AI, but what's crazy is I was just meeting with a friend the other day on our show and he was talking about how there's this technology where you can literally start to download your like cognition into a computer and stuff. I right. love Stephen King and he was actually very good natured about it with me, but he actually sued the people that were promoting the film because it was they were promoting it from the mind of Stephen King. And he said, it's not fair because that's not true. I mean, I'm very involved with actual virtual reality and AI now, kind of walked into the reality of movies I made uh, several decades ago. So now I'm actually living inside those movies, which is really crazy. I'm also kind of an accelerationist, which believes that we've got to jump in on these technologies very deeply because they are going to happen. It is a 3,000 foot tsunami coming at us. There's no way it's going to stop. I guess we're uh, on the show, everyone. So ran into some wonderful technical difficulties, but uh, thankfully I'm sitting here with producer Michael Coffey and also director Brett. Uh, Brett, how do I say your last name if I don't? It's Leonard, right? Leonard, yes. Brett Leonard, yes. Okay. I'm used to butchering everything. So something off the bat I wanted to ask you guys that doesn't have anything to do with the current movie Triumph. But Brett, I have to ask you this from talking to you before, from you doing yes. um, Stephen King's Lawnmower Man back in the day. Yeah. And yes. What was that, like 40 years ago? And no, 30, 30, 32. 32. Yes. So over three decades ago, you not only like predicted virtual like VR and AI, but what's crazy is I was just meeting with a friend the other day on our show and he was talking about how there's this technology where you can literally start to download your like cogn cognition into a computer and stuff and yeah. like in a sense you wrote that and adapted that from stephen king's lawnmower well, man when you made well actually you... stephen king's short story had nothing to do with those things uh stephen king's short story was about a telekinetically controlled lawnmower by a supernatural uh uh figure from the, the world of pan I added all of the virtual reality. So all the technology came from myself and my co-writer and my producer, uh, Jamil Everett, who is who has passed on now for many years. But uh, uh, yeah, so it, it, as much as it was a Stephen King, Stephen King movie, it, and none of the things that it's known for actually came from Stephen King. <laughs> it's it's a weird, it's actually a weird combination. Now I'm a huge Stephen King fan, by the way. I right. love Stephen King and he was actually very good natured about it with me but he actually sued the people that were promoting the film because it was they were promoting it from the mind of stephen king and he said it's not fair because that's not true and so he actually won they had to change the packaging uh, it's a precedent-setting case in hollywood history uh but uh, anyway yes I, I mean i'm very involved with actual virtual reality and ai now uh, and if you look at my film virtuosity with russell crowe and denzel washington that's about an AI character that's like a large language model of serial killers. Uh, that's what Russell Crowe plays. So these things are, uh, you know, it's an interesting that's time for me because. Brett, when you made, when, when Virtuosity came out also in like the, the 80s too, right? 95, 95, 95, 95. Okay. So still way ahead of, you were foreseen. Oh, yeah. Like, what are your thoughts now on on what's going on? Are you like, man, this is what I was seeing, or 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 were you it's, like, well, I'm actually working in actual virtual reality, actual AI. I have a company called Ubiquity VX, which is a, a company that's involved with healthcare uh, in virtual reality. Kind of the thing I showed in Lawnmower Man, where you know you're making his brain better in Lawnmower Man with virtual reality. That's what I'm doing for real. Uh, and so it's a it's an it, it's a time when I've kind of walked into the reality of movies I made uh, several decades ago. So now I'm actually living inside those movies, which is really crazy. <laughs> you are man. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, have I am one, the lawnmower man. <laughs> I have one follow up. Yeah. So with the AI, I just have one more thing. Is there 
stuff on that that are you more excited about the possibilities or are you t- like like in virtuosity like it, it could ai be starting to to basically in a different way i i just saw a move a short movie that was created by ai i don't know if it's real or not apparently oh, yeah, no. ai AI looks AI, like a, create, AI can create visuals. You can actually say something, about, just, you know, and crop. create visuals. Yeah. What about AI really creating videos of someone like falsifying, but making it look like it's through a real video and even somehow AI creating like DNA fingerprints or something? Is that something that's a concern? Of yours? Oh, there's many concerns. There are many concerns, and you know, and 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 look, I uh, I made cautionary tales about all this technology. So the fact that I'm like actually involved in the real technology is somewhat ironic. But as a storyteller, I believe in telling cautionary tales, and at the same time, I'm also kind of an accelerationist, which believes that we've got to jump in on these technologies very deeply because they are going to happen. It is a 3,000 foot tsunami coming at us. There's no way it's going to stop. So we need to right. actually embrace it and get ahead of it in terms of our own consciousness so that it doesn't, the, the negative aspects don't happen. And it's only going to happen if we as humans moderate and curate the use of AI. And that is, you know, there are a lot of aspects of it that make that difficult because AI is now starting to write AI, you know, it's starting to create you know, its I, own code. Right? And and that's that's a little scary. I mean, it's look, it's been it's been explored in so many science fiction novels and literature, uh, you know, in every which way, you know, that, that that could possibly be expressed. So we've we know the cautionary tales. We know that this technology is coming. It's going to change the nature of human interaction and life in many many ways. And we and I've never seen anything accelerate as fast as this AI has accelerated. Imagine at the beginning of the internal combustion engine, if everyone was given a car instantly that the internal combustion engine worked. That's the, that's the metaphor for what's happening right now with AI. Everybody's got access to this very powerful AI instantly through the internet. And that, that power is tremendously empowering, I think, for people. But it's also daunting in terms of putting the guardrails in place that are going to be necessary so that the negative components of AI don't happen. But I'm I'm more of an optimist, in all honesty, and I'm using AI every day in my work. So it's uh it's an incredible tool. So we need to right. actually embrace it and get ahead of it in terms of our own consciousness so that it doesn't the, the negative aspects don't happen. And it's only going to happen if we as humans moderate and curate the use of AI. And that is you know, there are a lot of aspects of it that make that difficult because AI is now starting to write AI, you know, it's starting to create you know, its own code. Right? And and that's that's a little scary. I mean, it's look, it's been it's been explored in so many science fiction novels and literature, uh, you know, in every which way, you know, that, that, that could possibly be expressed. So we've we know the cautionary tales. We know that this technology is coming. It's going to change the nature of human interaction and life in many, many ways. And we and I've never seen anything accelerate as fast as this AI has accelerated. Imagine at the beginning of the internal combustion engine, if everyone was given a car instantly that the internal combustion engine worked. That's the, that's the metaphor for what's happening right now with AI. Everybody's got access to this very powerful AI instantly through the internet. And that, that power is tremendously empowering, I think, for people, but it's also daunting in terms of putting the guardrails in place that are going to be necessary so that the negative components of AI don't happen. But I'm I'm more of an optimist, in all honesty, and I'm using AI every day in my work. So it's uh it's an incredible tool. In in your business and I, I'm I guessing even in movie making and editing and stuff, that's I don't know if that's being used yet. I know it is with a lot of the, some of the stuff that we do for like some of the shorter clips and reels, which is obviously a little different than editing an entire movie, but I don't yeah, know. The, the AI is beyond, look, I'm working in actual virtual experience, uh, again, mostly in, focused in the healthcare area, 
for virtual therapies, et cetera, which are very, have proven themselves out. And so we are utilizing AI to power those uh, immersive experiences. So it's a very, it's, it's fundamental to so many technologies now, to so many things that are happening, especially in the immersive virtual media space. You have to have AI in order to have true interaction and, and the, the ability to do really sophisticated things with the technology. Is, is it similar to what you're doing to what Elon Musk's Neuralink is kind of doing with some of their no, stuff or is it? A no, I mean, that's, that's a hardware thing. That's actually implanting, you know, uh, links into the human brain. It, it's, we're doing things that are helping physical therapy, helping uh, behavioral therapy, occupational therapy, sports training, things that are geared to using a virtual environment for wellness. Um, and uh, and it's called Ubiquity VX. Uh, you okay. know, there's, there's a website that people want to check it out, ubiquityvx.com. Um, and it's uh, it's powered uh, by, uh, uh, there's now a new company that's involved called uh, Infinite Reality. Um, and they are uh, a very big metaverse company. So there's a lot of really interesting things going on right now in the context of virtual therapy and what is writ large called virtual medicine. The use of virtual experience because of neuroplasticity and many other things that allow uh, virtual environments to actually heal people. And that that's why I wanted to do something positive with the technology because I told cautionary tales in the past, right? So I've told the cautionary tales, now I want to try to do something positive, basically. Well, that, that bringing going forward to you guys collaborating for this movie, Triumph, speaking of something positive, yes. with our good man and producer here, Michael Coffey, and then you guys connected with Breaking Bad's R.J. Mitty, and then uh, Terrence Howard. Mm -hmm. I think at a point, Kevin Spacey was casted in. I know you. this has been a long, there's yeah. Hollywood doesn't this, have any. This film has gone through an amazing journey to get to where it's finally being released uh, you know, uh, on Amazon on February 26th. Uh, everybody check it out. It's, it, it's a beautiful uh, inspirational story that Mike Coffey wrote the screenplay, also produced the film uh, with other producers, of course. And we, uh, you know, it's, it, it's a, a very inspirational story that for those that have seen it um, have really have been affected by its inspiration. And that, to me, is one of the greatest gifts uh, of making a movie. It's like what you, you go through hell to make a movie, in all honesty. Uh, this one had its share of, uh, of very deep challenges. Yeah. And yet at the end of the day, you make something that inspires people. So that's what's great about it. My, I, I was telling Michael, we talked on the phone a couple of days ago and he was saying, <laughs> Uh, because we we had uh, Brett, we did a show with you and RJ Mitty back uh, yes. the first time it released, and yes. um, yes. I remember Michael was telling me he's like this. I'm excited, but this has been eight years of hell. But I don't give up. We never give up. Mm -hmm. And I was saying, you know, what I've learned from having my own company for 20 years, doing the show, having hundreds of guests, whether they're actors athletes, business owners, there's no overnight, like the same correlation exists. Like every overnight success is like a 10 to 15 year overnight success. And no one sees the real grind, like well, it really behind the scenes, you know? There's no free lunch on this planet, um, you know? Uh, and, and the truth is, Sometimes the more passionate you are about a project, the more difficult it, it can be to, to get it made um, because of just, you know, everyone doesn't see that same thing until it's actually made. So being making feature films is a marathon. It is not a sprint. Um, and, you know, many, 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 many great feature films, especially in the independent realm, independent films, and, and you know, Triumph is an independently produced film, uh, have had, you know, over 10 year histories, you know, at least uh, right. to get to the point. And that's just the nature of uh, the beast. I've, you know, I've been making films now for over 30 years. So I know this in my bones. And so when I get involved, 
I don't necessarily assume, oh, and it's going to be done in a few months and it'll be out there. I know that it could be a journey. This one was a much longer journey than I thought it was going to be. Um, and I'm sure that's how Michael felt as well. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> because he started, then, you know, it started with his story. Then this I had to get Michael's Paul. story. You yeah. Know? I started to time myself in 2014 and got us involved in 15. We all got together and started doing it. So it's yes. been a crazy journey. But but you know when 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 uh, you know because as uh, this is a story of uh, of a young man who has cerebral palsy like Michael has and and R J Mitty as you know has cerebral palsy as well the actor uh, and so yeah. it was a very it was a, it was a movie about inclusion it was a movie about uh, you know true diversity and and true uh, a true story being played by people that really understand what it is uh, you know both Michael and. RJ and, the, and so for me, I really had to follow along as a director more than uh, you know uh, be leading in that area because they understood what it means to have cerebral palsy. So when we came time to show the film, it was theatrically released in 2021, uh, right as COVID opened everything up. And when uh, many many families who had uh, you know disabled children came, and it was they were all just clapping and crying and it was the, one of the most amazing experiences of showing a film for me to an audience um, again and again and again because of uh you know because of the truth of what's being put there and 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 what it expresses about that experience uh and it expresses it in a very inspirational positive way uh which is testament to both really? Michael, michael's writing and also rj's uh rj's portrayal which is really Phenomenal, and everyone else, of course, involved. Uh, you know, it's a it's a great cast, and uh, you know, to make an inspirational film that touches the heart, that's that's an amazing experience, and I I just feel blessed to have been able to be part of it. Something that has been so cool to me about this too is a lot of people that see me on social media and stuff know about me from the show, from the podcast, but they don't my core company dream shine is for people with developmental disabilities after the age of high school and it yeah. got creating that even at age 26 having a fight against the governor of ohio to get rules and laws changed and um open our program and make it different and innovative and not where they just kept putting everyone into a box and they used to just the options were so limited and I was talking with Michael. This is so cool because an actor isn't playing the part of someone with cerebral policy. It's someone, RJ Mitty, who actually has it, is yeah. playing the part of someone. And I and Michael and I were talking about how cool and, and needed that is also to be able to bring people in with disabilities to, to play some of these different parts. Obviously, not just because they have a disability, they have to be qualified and work really hard like RJ does, but yeah. that's a really cool thing. And and Michael, I'm sure, was that something that you were like really specific on or did that just kind of happen? The stars aligned where RJ got involved. Like, were you like, were you guys trying to just cast whoever oh. would be best or were you oh. intentionally trying to cast someone that had a oh. similar? Oh, well, I have was. Way before I was going to take myself. So I was hoping to take the lead role. Then I saw Breaking Bad and thought, well, this guy would probably be that bad to me. So I decided to contact his manager and I was able to get to my script. And the rest is, is, is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Michael, Michael uh, brought RJ into the. Uh, uh, you know, Mike. When I got involved, Michael had already cast RJ, which is one of the things that was really exciting for me uh, as a director because I wanted to work with RJ, uh, given his amazing work on Breaking Bad, and also because I knew he he had cerebral palsy. The part had cerebral palsy. 
I wanted to be a part of something that was inclusive in that way. Uh, and it, so it was a very special project from the very beginning. You know, all the challenges notwithstanding, it was just a very special project. And, uh, you know, directing RJ was very different because, you know, he, he having cerebral palsy, he understood things about this character that I could never understand as a director because I don't have cerebral palsy. And so I had to allow that just to be raw, you know, and, and it was a wonderful experience. It was, it was a great experience of, of an actor being able to give me uh, this true reality and rawness uh, in most every moment. And that's a very rare experience uh, when you're directing, <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> sometimes. Well, yeah, yeah. Well, also, I was thinking too, Brett, that um, some of your other movies in the past, you know, when you're looking at Lawnmower Man, Virtuosity, a lot of these amazing, cool, like sci-fi-ish, is was this um what made them connect with you obviously you did an amazing job but i would be thinking yeah man, if i'm looking at someone that does this type of movie brett might not be the guy that i'm and then mm -hmm. you might be like i don't know if this is a type of movie that i would normally like how well, did the how did those connections yeah. happen well, well it was michael michael yeah, yeah real quick back in 2010 I had been attached to my Firefly script because my story about Firefly involved AR technology, yeah, AR, AR gives me reality. So I went back to check my Firefly movie and then later type him about so I can tell you about or Give me test now time. So I even I got the Susie the more rejected first. Yeah, you know, it was for me, look, I, I love all all genres of cinema. Actually, one of my other hit films is called T Rex in IMAX 3D, and that's a children's film about dinosaurs. So I actually, you know, have made a lot of different films in different genres over the years. I, and I've always loved, I love the, the, the Hollywood pass where a director would work for a studio and they'd be brought in to do a Western one weekend. The next week would be a, a noir thriller. And so I, I always was wanting to be part of that kind of filmmaking because I love all genres. So the ability to make an inspirational sports story, which I had never done before, was really uh, exciting to me. Uh, because it's a different language, it's a different uh, style of cinema, and uh, it, and because of that, it allows you to stretch yourself uh, as a storyteller, and uh, and that was a great opportunity that Michael gave me. Yeah. How it's and it's so I I watched the movie the last time I had you guys on with RJ the first time it released and I loved it, and I don't want to give anything away too to anyone, but I even liked like the realism of how you guys chose to end it and stuff too. I, I thought that was really cool. I'm not doing any spoiler alerts, but um, so get to, to then Terrence Howard as the coach. Did you guys have to, did you start shooting with Kevin Spacey and then you had to stop and I'm not trying to, we don't have to get into stuff that I know Hollywood. Oh, Kevin, Kevin Spacey, had Kevin Spacey awesome. was actually, Kevin Spacey was actually never actually attached. There was a producer that she'll go nameless uh, that was uh, saying Kevin Spacey was attached. When I first started shooting the movie, I thought Kevin Spacey was going to show up and play the coach at some point. That never happened. And it turned out to be something that went into the courts. And that's one of the things that was very, uh, uh, very challenging about this film that Michael had to go through, uh, you know, very deeply. And. Um, it, so we got past that and eventually, uh, one of the producers, uh, Michael Klofi knew, uh, Terrence Howard. And so did I, because I had actually produced a documentary that he was part of, uh, that was about Memphis, the classic Memphis, uh, musicians. And so, uh, because of that between us, we, 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 uh, you know, convinced, uh, Terrence to be the coach on the film. That's awesome. Yeah, I saw, um, I, I, I think I've actually seen that. I didn't know you did that, Brett. 
that yeah, I was I one swear. of the. I, I'm 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 listed as a producer on it, but actually I was very involved in that project uh, in many ways. But I'm I'm one of the producers on the film. It actually won the audience award in 2014 at the South by Southwest uh, Festival. It's called Take Me to the River, um, and uh, it was a great uh, a man named uh, uh, Martin Shore uh, directed it and produced it. Uh, I was one of the producers that uh, helped get that project uh, uh, done. So between working with, man, young, young, it, it was, was it Pierce Brosnan and, and Lawnmower Man? Back yeah, in yeah. God, it's, um, the, I just realized that. Yeah, and then young Russell Crowe and Virtuosity, too. Yeah, yeah. Did you, did you, uh, were you like involved in in picking them back in the day for that as as the oh, director? Oh yes, absolutely. Talent? No, because, I mean, as the director, I was. Oh, no, I was who they are? Yeah, I was working with uh, you know um, casting directors, of course. Uh, uh, you know, uh, it was, who were fantastic uh, on helping you know look at all the different options. Uh, if for Longmore Man, Pierce had just come off of Remington Steel. He was a big TV star, but he was not a movie star yet. And so yeah. Lawnmower Man was part of what made him a movie star because it was a hit movie. Uh, and right after Lawnmower Man, he got Bond. Uh, so it was part of that, you know, part of that uh, trajectory for him. And you know, he's a fantastic, you know, actor on every level, obviously. And, and so it was great to work with Pierce. And, and he's actually remained a friend for all these years. And, uh, and then with Russell... He was completely unknown almost. Um, you know, he was mostly known in Australia for doing Australian films. And mm -hmm. I saw him in a film called Romper Stomper. And I was looking for a, a you know, a, a villain that you could, you know, hate and love at the same time. And his, his character Hando that he played in Romper Stomper was exactly that. And so I uh, took that to uh, Deborah Quilla and I at Paramount. She was the head of casting and Paramount at that time looked at that and we both agreed that Russell was going to be one of the biggest stars of his generation. We took it to Sherry Lansing yeah. at Paramount and Sherry approved it, uh, as did Denzel. Denzel was very, very supportive of getting Russell into the film. And you got to remember, this is a movie with Denzel Washington, who was a huge movie star at that time, and yeah. Russell was not. So, you know, it was, a, it was a great thing to bring together. And of course, later, they starred together in Ridley Scott's film, American Gangster many, many years later. Right. Oh, yeah. man, that's crazy. That's cool. Yeah, I remember when Gladiator came out. That was the first time I personally saw Russell yeah. Crowe. I yeah. remember this movie is amazing. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. Virtuoso was several years before Gladiator. It was just before <laughs> uh, he it was just before L.A. Confidential, um, which was oh, very big yeah. for him. And then The Insider. Uh, and, uh, you know, but, but, you know, the reviews of Virtuosity were a star making performance by Russell Crowe. So it was a very important film for him in, in his trajectory. That's so cool. Are you doing, um, you know, what's funny. I, I was testing some little AI stuff and I was asking it questions about this and you guys, and one thing that popped up was, uh, a movie you may or may not be working on about the night marchers, like the. The legend oh from Hawaii. That's, that's amazing. Uh, I mean, the fact that AI knows about the Night Marchers is very. Let me tell you what. AI, let me tell you what AI told me. <laughs> I, I was checking out some of your stuff, Brett, and we, uh, you and I talked for a long time after the last uh, yeah. show too. I've got to know you. Brett's an awesome guy, and Michael's stayed connected. Michael's freaking amazing. I love both thank of you. you. But this you. I, it was funny. It said. Um, Okay, it said that you wrote it in a bungalow in Maui yes. last year. <laughs> not last year, not last year, many years ago, many, many years ago. Okay, um, so, and it said Night Marchers, I think they did it like when it was going to start filming and then they're saying they were starting to film it in Australia and it yes. said there might be a cameo from Russell Crowe. And, yes. and then they mentioned Rossity and uh, but they talk about you shooting it in or writing it in a bungalow in Maui. So then I started going to YouTube and I'm like, I wonder if there's a trailer if this came out. But then it started showing me 
things about like the the legendary night marchers and yeah, i had so the night marchers heard. yeah night legendary. marchers is the premier ghost story of the polynesian people uh, uh specifically hawaiian polynesians and uh it is an amazing mythology it's it's really scary it's you know it's the beauty and paradise of the jungle with like the scariest you know spirit story you can imagine and by the way it's real it's real. are you, are you it's, I mean, real? it's real are you i mean the, the, the night marchers do march on the 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 three nights of pokane as they're called which is the dark of the moon there are certain trails in the hawaiian islands that you're supposed to stay off of during the dark of the moon at night because the night marchers who are uh, supposedly ancient warrior spirits that were fallen in battle in an improper manner are walking from the battle site to a heiau. The heiaus were the sacred, you know, sort of uh, ceremonial sites, like the churches of the Hawaiian Huna tradition. I, I learned a lot about the Hawaiian tradition, which, by the way, is amazing. It's an amazing thing. It's very hidden, by the way, to most people. Yeah. Uh, and and so that is a project I still want to make because it is a tremendous story. It's a tremendous mythology, and no one's ever made a, a mainstream project about this. And and you know it's 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 like as cool as the vampire mythology. You know it's that it's that that level. And so I'm uh, I'm really excited about you know the idea of one doing that at some point and also doing it in Hawaii. I mean, I actually was at one point going to shoot it in Australia because I was living in Australia and Australia has places like Byron Bay that are very much like Maui, very much like Hawaii. Um, but Hawaii, it really should be shot in Hawaii. And the, and the reason I originally wrote it was because I wanted to shoot a movie in Hawaii because I loved Hawaii so much. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> that was... You know what? Areas. I'll be to do a... We'll do a follow-up show as that's coming out in, in Hawaii. Be happy yeah, to yeah. join you there. And also, I don't know. Maybe you don't want to do it anywhere else because you don't want the you don't want to make them mad and have them come after you. Exactly in right. No, no. I had I had high high priests of the Huna tradition, which are called Kahunas. You've heard of the you're in Kahuna. Oh, well, yeah. the Kahuna. There, there was one of the chief Kahunas of the Hawaiian Islands was my consultant, a man named Sam Kahai. I, I think he may have passed on now, but uh, Sam Kahai was very very you know, embedded in the Huna tradition. And it is a very sacred thing. And I, I, I won't screw up with it. I won't screw it, <laughs> screw around with it because it's, it's very I powerful. Uh, I just start, I'd never heard of it. And I started watching some clips on yeah. YouTube where people were just talking about it. And I'm like, man, this is crazy. And they were, a lot of them were saying like, this is real. There's real stuff. That's I happened. experienced, I experienced the night marchers myself when I was on Hawaii and, the Hawaiian Islands. I mean, I heard the drums. I felt the presence of them. Uh, you know, it was during the nights of Pocane. It was. It was. Uh, it was one of the things that spurred me to to write the film. And that's yeah. really cool that you wrote it in in Hawaii, like kind of yeah. in that <laughs> in that isolation there. Did you finish? Have you finished writing it, or is it? Still yeah, no. In the, the, script, the script was finished many years ago, it, it, and and it was it almost got made. But with a Hawaiian producer, I'm sorry, with with an Australian producer, who we're going to shoot some of it in Hawaii and some of it in Australia, and then uh, after going through pre-production, funded pre-production, we were funded and everything, uh, he it fell out because something happened in his business reality that didn't allow him to finance the film. Something that happens, by the way, a lot in independent films. This is something again. Independent films are very difficult, you know, to to get going. Uh, especially from the financing standpoint, you just have to have tenacity and stick to it. You have to stick to it and never, as Michael said, if we stick to it, we will triumph. You know, Michael right. Always, right. always had that. He always had that energy with yeah. trying. And that was one of the things that kept me going over the years because Michael was so focused on getting the film done. Yeah. Together we will triumph. Yeah, together we will triumph. That is, he, he he ends Love. every email with that, and uh, it's been you know for ten years, and now finally now the film did come out in other as other places on the on the planet. It was yeah. shown in Australia and the UK. UK yeah. yeah, and so now it's finally being released digitally in North America. It was released theatrically in North America, and that's what we talked last time, Mark. Um, you know, so and that was a great experience because we had a lot of 
uh, amazing feedback for, for the film when it was theatrically released right after COVID opened up the theaters. That meant that, you know, the, the crowds were not huge because it was still COVID time, right? But uh, right. it did, it's an inspirational story that people were responding to. So now it's going to get to an even larger audience uh, through Amazon. And yeah. uh, that's that's really exciting. Yeah. Amazon, Apple TV, Apple TV, iTunes, Review, yes. Cable, cable Networks, the whole thing. Yes, and there'll be windows that of uh, release, of course. You know, okay. And, and, I was at, we'll put the links to the show to the where people can can they pre-order it yet on on any I of don't them? I don't know I don't know I don't think so I, I we just we just know that it's coming out February twenty sixth right. on February twenty sixth. Yeah. yeah. I think okay. Apple TV, Apple TV, twenty six. Yeah. Okay. So and stuff too. I know you guys have, like you said, eight eight years of hell. That's crazy. It was really. I mean, you're used to it. Brett. It sounds like you. Yeah. <laughs> you've been through that. So mm -hmm. it's like, but with Michael, you know, you've. It's really awesome. There is really yeah. the story behind the story of triumph literally is you triumphing throughout your whole life and then also persevering through into Hollywood, which chews normal people up and spits them out, you know, and then you're mm -hmm. facing on top of that with, with your, not even disability, it's your ability, which I call your superpower really, because that's what you transformed it to. And look at, look at what you've done with this and look who you, you've brought, this amazing director Brett here, who's known for decades of what he's done, Terrence Howard, R.J. Mitty, right after finishing Breaking Bad. I mean, that's that's amazing. Yeah, yeah. Well, it is. It is. Well, I I have a degree in business, so I use my business and marketing skills to help me produce this movie. And that was very helpful to have that higher education to get yeah. this going. Yeah, well, it it took it took Michael's indomitable spirit, mm -hmm. which is also this. It's also yeah, exactly, which is also the, uh, the the spirit of the character that RJ plays. Because Michael RJ is essentially playing a version of Michael, um, uh, because you know this is this is a semi autobiographical story. Um, that that uh, Michael wrote here. So it's you know it's it, it, that kept everyone going. I, I mean that kept me going on this through you know what looked like insurmountable challenges, uh, both legal and with people involved and all kinds of things. Uh, that you know the detail of that you'll have to read in my memoirs. <laughs> so yeah, there's a lot of yeah. a lot of interest. There's a tremendous story behind the making of this movie. That involves all kinds of crazy nefarious things that uh, that are very indicative of the independent film world. And most people don't understand independent film is a daunting thing. Anyone that finishes any film, uh, I, I get my hat is off to them. Uh, let alone one that actually connects with the audience and uh, you know inspires. So it's uh, you know this is a tremendous uh, uh, this is a tremendous achievement for Michael. Uh, to have started this project by living it and then also making it happen. So it really is, it's really his triumph. That's, that's the reality of this project. That's amazing. And the, the business part, people, people a lot of times don't comprehend that if it is all a business, it's, it's passion, oh, yeah. it's art at the end of the day. It, I, I've met with different people behind the scenes that are working. I'm like teaching them some, I'm like, if you guys could just shut up and stop arguing about this stupid thing, you're, you're spending like $5 million a day just to, because yes. two of you are in two different offices, not talking while the whole cast is just sitting there and you're still having to, I'm like, you just resolve this the way we can resolve conflict. Like we do in any other business and you can move onward and upward and everyone can save money and make more money and have the opportunity to finish the movie exactly. you know so many things, and, and it happens exactly. in business but so many things get stopped for the dumbest the dumbest reasons 
Yeah, no, and, and, I, I another thing we should mention about this film uh, is that it won the Ruderman Family Foundation Award for uh, uh, depiction, uh, authentic depiction of disability. Uh, and this is one of the top awards given to, to that. Um, the other films that were honored uh, the year this came out was, you know, were big studio films like uh, uh, Quiet Place 2, you know, giant budgets. Uh, this is very much a, you know, a very, uh, very independent, uh, very, you know, low budget film that doesn't look it. We made it look like a, you know, a much bigger film, but it won this award. And then I went to, uh, I was the one able to go to the Rudiman Family Foundation uh, Awards breakfast that just happened actually a couple months ago uh, because it was delayed because of COVID and all those things. And it was uh, at the Directors Guild building. It was with Variety. Uh, and it was a very star-studded event. Uh, and when they showed the video of the Ruderman Family Foundation Award, most of it was from Triumph. And I was very, very uh, thrilled and proud to feel that because one, RJ really re represents this community so well. Um, and so uh, true, you know, a true hero in that community. And so, um, and is so, you know, just charismatic and likable um, that uh, it really, shown through and and that breakfast was a great moment for me it was a a beautiful you know fairly high-end hollywood moment but for a very small film that struggled you know we were the little engine that could uh and uh it, it, it got it recognized so that was that was wonderful i wish michael you could have been there for that but uh it was uh it was a tremendous uh experience well with a re-release there'll be more there'll be more coming where my Michael yeah. will be able to yeah. attend and and I was thinking with it with how low the budget was from watching it, yeah. you guys did such a great job. It, it you was, cannot tell. It looks it like a, a total mainstream, like every shot, everything. It doesn't look like uh like after school special or something. It looks like you guys had like a real budget and everything comes out so crisp and clean and all the shots. And I would never would have even known that watching it. Had you guys well, not told we, me. We had, we had to use a lot of ingenuity to do that. One of the things is we had to shoot in a working high school in Nashville, Tennessee. It was literally a working high school. So we were getting shots in the corridors while people were in classes, the summer classes, and then they would come out, you know, and, and we had to stop because we couldn't be, you know, uh, get interrupting the class structure. I mean, it was one of the craziest, but most innovative shoots I've ever been on. Yeah, it was, and then we utilized the, the high school students uh, as high school students in the film. And we asked them all, so, dress like, like it's the 1980s, dress like it's the 1980s, because it was, the film took place in the 80s. So we were able to do things that usually you'd not be able to do in a, in a super low budget film, which it was, um, and, and it, it just, it, it, I was trying to make what I, you know, thought was the equivalent of a John Hughes movie with these themes, uh, you know, because That's John Hughes made, made his films in the 80s. So it was an 80s style to it. Uh, and, and I really loved that, you know, his film and his cinema. And so it was great to do something in that genre. Be, before, um, before I, I have to jump off here, I, I work, I, Worked hard. I always wish we had more time. I worked hard to make sure we could pop this in before this release. And yep. then everyone it was my fault because uh, the audio was all screwed up on our other thing. But hey, we, we got it all to work. I, is there, um, with that being in a high school and there was high school students, is there any crazy or funny stories that any of the high schoolers try to do, like jump out in the middle of you guys shooting or something you stupid? You know what? Or Myself they were all very stuff. they were all amazing and by the way they still are some of them are still in touch with michael i think and still in touch i mean they're they're still so jazzed that they were part of this movie uh you know and they kind of created a little community another thing i should mention is my brother greg leonard uh composed the score for the film um and oh, you know again it was a micro budget film so we did a lot of it's a full orchestral score uh you know on a very you know on a shoestring it's a tremendous score and he was the first score to ever be minted as an NFT uh, in history. Yeah, and so now that the film is being released in North America, he's going to be coming out with uh, those aspects of it as well. So there's some, there's a lot of really interesting historic things 
with this project uh, that are going to now become known because it'll get to a larger audience. That's amazing that, geez, he did it. That was the score I was going to say too. It did not sound like low, but like he, no, you guys are incredibly gifted. Yeah. Us Leonard's don't do, don't, don't do low budget sound sounding or looking things, but sometimes that's all we have to work with. <laughs> it's just, you may have low budget, through. but when you, Wait, you're going to yeah. have it not like it's low budget or sound like it. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> you guys did an, an amazing job and um, I'm happy we were able to get this. So I'm going to work with our team so we can get this released uh, right around the time the movie re-releases, Triumph re-releases, or hopefully right before would be awesome. And uh, Michael, I would love for you to end off the show with what, what were your famous words that you say at the end of every shoot and every set and on your email? Well, together we will triumph. That's together right. we will triumph. And, and we will, and we have. So congratulations, Mike and everybody. I really encourage anybody that wants to see just a really inspiring film from an a inspiring true story of Michael's life. Please go check out Triumph on Amazon, Apple Plus, uh, Apple TV. I mean, all the different streaming services that, but Amazon is the one that's actually, uh, you know, hosting it. Um, so uh, it, it's, uh, and, and that's starting at February 26th. So look forward to people seeing the film. Yeah, yeah. February 26th, everyone, listen, if you're listening to this or watching it on video, Everyone that's a part of the show, Elevating Beyond, this is something I've seen it. It's amazing. And you need to support this because these people are doing incredible things. Not to mention you have Terrence Howard, RJ Mitty. You've got Brett directing this. You've got Michael Coffey, who it's yeah. about Rhoda has put his life into eight hour, or eight years of hell to not give up. And this is a beautiful thing. So everyone support this, check it out, and make sure you're purchasing it. And together, we will triumph. Yeah. Together, we will triumph. All right. Thank Great talking to you, Mike. Mark. Thank Take you. Care. Mike, All right. we'll you. Guys, Bye -bye. thank you for working Bye -bye. through the difficulties. No problem. <laughs> All right. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right. Bye.